what, uh, what a challenge uh, has been laid bare, but let's remember the importance of optimism and a sense of uh, empowerment that uh, solutions are available. Now, it's, um, we're moving on very, uh, very swiftly to our panel discussion, and we have uh, Bruce Katz, who's the Vice President of the Brookings um, Institute, and Philip Broad, who is um, Executive Director of the Cities Programme um, here at, um, at LSE. And we're going to begin this part of the session by inviting, first of all, Bruce to comment and react, and, uh, and then uh, Philip. And then, in the time that we have available, after these, our panellists have had a decent exchange and argument with each other, um, we'll take questions. There's not going to be a huge amount of time, but we'll do our best. Right, now. From here or from? Uh, wherever you're most comfortable. Uh, so first of all, um, thanks for having me. Uh, I want to say happy birthday to the Urban Edge. <laughs> yes. Um, I would sing it, but then people would flee for the, uh, for the <laughs> exits. Um, uh, it is really important to understand the impact that this effort has had on urban research, on urban language, on urban policy, on urban practice. And so Uta, this is about the highest ROI that any philanthropy has on anything. Um, so congratulations for that. Really sobering presentations. And in theory, um, what we would need to do in a country like the United States, so I'll just speak from an American perspective, is you would have a national government take the leadership role in setting the platform mm -hmm. for radical reduction yeah. in carbon. Emissions. Exactly. Uh, you would set a price on carbon. Uh, you would invest at scale in clean energy research and development. You would basically send signals through tax, through spending, and housing, and infrastructure, through the multiple dimensions of a society uh, to go down a different path. I mean, the reality, as everyone in this room knows, despite President Obama's best intentions, there essentially is no national government in the United States today. Uh, it is mired in partisan gridlock, uh, and essentially it has sent a signal to the United States, to the society, um, we are basically not acting. And so the rest of y'all, cities and metropolitan areas in particular, you're in charge. And so what essentially is happening, um, because states for the most part are also on a frolic and detour, with the exception of California and maybe a few others, um, cities and metropolitan areas are essentially being forced to step up, not just as city governments, but as networks of public, private, civic, university, labor, community leaders, and to take the hard actions necessary to the extent that they can to make a difference. So there are three kinds of actions happening in the land of climate denial right now that I think are important to focus on. The first, our cities are beginning to invest in a new kind of built environment. So what are we talking about? And Karen had a great slide up there about yeah, exactly. the various ways of looking yeah. at this. Sustainable transit infrastructure matched with new land use and zoning. So this is Los Angeles, this is Denver, basically going to voters to basically raise their sales tax, to raise tens of billions of dollars over multiple decades, to build large state-of-the-art transit systems that then begin to alter development patterns. Um, now in the past, some of those investments were made by our national government. Now essentially cities are having to go to their own citizens and say, well, they're gone. It's up to us. Other cities, Washington, D.C., investing in a new kind of clean water infrastructure. Cities like Philadelphia, basically investing in new core city infrastructure in the downtown and midtown so that they can grow 10x residential, 5x jobs around Drexel, University of Pennsylvania, essentially the core of the city. So, what we're seeing first and foremost are cities using their own financing, 
or going to voters for new revenues or going essentially aggregating public, private, and civic capital to do what we all know has to be done, right? More choice in transportation, more density and accessibility, all the things that Karen were ta was talking about, but having have to be done through local resources, essentially, or local action that connects to institutional investors. Second piece, what do cities do? They set rules. They set building codes. They set land, zoning and land use ordinances. They have mandates on reporting on emissions. And so that's the second thing that cities are beginning to do. Now, Portland, Oregon has been doing this for decades. They drew an urban growth boundary back in the 1970s. And no surprise, where has most of the growth gone in Portland, Oregon? Um, we don't compare Atlanta to Barcelona, we compare Atlanta to Portland. <laughs> <laughs> um, because Americans generally don't have a passport, but that's okay. Um, but so not surprisingly, there's been a large amount of reinvestment in Portland, Oregon. And because of that reinvestment and because of the sort of tilting of growth and development to the core, you've got the benefits of density that enable you to build out streetcars, build out public transit, build out the kind of radical mixed use, then increasingly not just a new demographics, but a new kind of open innovative economy want. Boston has done this on energy efficiency. Uh, other cities have done it on a range of other signals to the market. Last bit, and this really may be the greatest contribution of the United States to deal with climate change in the absence of any national leadership, which frankly I think won't be coming for quite some time. Mm. Um, so you all watch the 2016 election. Uh, you must be horrified <laughs> by the reality show that is going on in the United States. You know, buckle your seat belts. It's going to be a bumpy ride, right? <laughs> so what we will contribute to climate change solutions will be out of our innovative sector. And that's because the United States still, through our advanced research institutions, through our military, and through our national labs, has an incredible depth of basic science, which then leads to the commercialization of ideas, the startup of companies, the maturing of companies, that essentially create the new kinds of products and services to help us mitigate climate and carbon emissions at scale. Now, is this going to solve the problem? Obviously not. But if you go to Atlanta, which, again, is the poster child for sprawl, there is Georgia Tech. If you go to Pittsburgh, which is sprawl in a no-growth kind of uh, metropolis, there is Carnegie Mellon. If you go to Boston, there is MIT. And these are the places around which now are congregating entrepreneurs and startups and global companies with their own R&D and investors and venture and a large segment network of researchers that basically get up every morning and say, how do we, through market innovation, you know, the creation of a product that can be then introduced in a Beijing or Mumbai or a service that then can be applied, how can we contribute to climate change solutions. So I think at the end of the day, what cities do, and the urban age really is at the vanguard of basically showing this. One city innovates, it creates a new norm of how to invest, of how to solve problems, and, and you know, this goes from relatively, in the scheme of things, simple things like bike lanes to much more complicated large infrastructure solutions but new norms are established that then get basically spread horizontally across the world. And again, cities are centers of innovation, centers of economy that are increasingly uh, the places in which the new products and services will be invented to be applied. So the United States, from an outside perspective, again, must be semi-horrifying, or maybe it's just completely horrifying. Um, but our cities and our metropolitan areas are stepping up to deal with climate change. And they are inventing, I think, what essentially will be new norms that will 
replicate, be replicated across the world. Great, Bruce. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Philip. Thank you, Tessa. Uh, let me try to bring all of this back to the Urban Age program. And what we have just heard from Nick and Karen is how climate policy has embraced the urban dimension. And uh, I want to reflect a bit how urbanism has engaged with climate, using our last 10 years as sort of a reflection point. And I can see two main arguments that can be made. The first one is, and given the particular urgency we have just seen, that we have probably not been engaging as urbanists with this subject enough. And there are a couple of reasons which I want to speculate on why that is the case. First, there's the technical language of climate change mitigation and adaptation, which tends to disguise the deeply political nature of climate action in cities. Yeah, I'll is. come back to this in a moment. There are very strong associations, particularly in some circles, and these circles are big in the urban world, where we see that climate policy directly sort of in sync with technocratic, top-down government intervention, which not only assumes that efficient governments exist everywhere, but also is at odds with more cooperative forms, postmodern modern notions of urban governance. And then there's the radical change required to achieve the two degree sort of mm. global warming target, which directly leads us to a tension between what you could refer to as an urban evolutionary process and a revolution. Think of strict building and land use regulations which will probably have to severely limit suburbanization, conventional car use, and the use of unsustainable building materials, the main point which Karen was making. So as a result, and reflecting on our urban age conversations and the cities we have been working in, climate action has remained kind of disconnected mm. from particularly daily urban practice we have been discussing, from more ordinary city perspectives, issues around urban inequality, poverty, and the right to the city. Take one example which we have been exposed to when we were working uh, in South Africa. Post-apartheid housing policy in South Africa, which for very obvious and culturally sensitive reasons was uh, promoting the ownership and therefore the further proliferation of very low density bungalows at the urban periphery. Now the environmental damage of this policy is fairly obvious and it's enormous. But if we come with our climate change debate to the discussion, we really need to understand the politics of the urban expansion that is playing out. Now from a completely different perspective, and I'm turning now the view, it's absolutely clear that city-level sustainability thinking, which actually is maybe even more mature than national-level sustainability thinking, and the pushing of the urban sustainability community have led to an entirely new recognition of the role of cities at the national and international level. Karen mentioned that we shouldn't take it for granted that the IPCC chapter has, in some ways, a chapter on cities, although they are not allowed to call it cities. It's the human settlements. Uh, take the most recent uh, urban SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. We can't take these things for granted. They were established for the first time. It was a battle. Now, as part of the urban age, there were actually very few issues that we discussed over the last 10 years that didn't have a central and direct link with the underlying arguments that connect cities and climate change. In some ways, urban climate action is simply common sense urban development let me give you a few examples of how good urbanism equals a better climate. Richard Sennett's elaboration on the universal importance of fine grain, mixed and intensely interconnected urban development is one example. But there was also our colleague, the Indian urbanist Geetam Tiwari, who constantly emphasized the importance of enabling the most equitable means of travel for social reasons, and that is walking. And the late Indian transport expert Fabio Casseroli, who worked a lot and informed us on the importance of efficient and affordable public transport. It's exactly these co-benefits, these mutual benefits, which we really need to, I think, centrally regard as our notion of hope. Three final examples. Compact, 
connected and coordinated urban growth, which we communicated with Nick so strongly in the New Climate Economy report on better growth, better climate, not only means a big plus for, yes, the economy, and yes, for the climate, but it means to avoid excessive forms of peripheralization of the urban poor, which is socially unsustainable. We have done work in three emerging megacities, Sao Paulo, Istanbul, and Mumbai, where we looked at how poorer segments of the population can access daily services, including their jobs and how long it takes compared to richer sections of the population. The difference in Sao Paulo, which is very car-oriented and sprawling, is at least double at already very high absolute levels. Poor people are on top of being sort of disadvantaged, punished in terms of access time. By contrast, more compact, more transit-oriented, Mumbai and Istanbul actually equalize that access across income groups quite elegantly. Now, social inclusion is actually a big driver for this sort of public transport policy we're seeing around the world. When bus rapid transit was invented in Curitiba and further scaled in, in Bogota, it was a strategy for more efficient and equitable transport. The now re-elected mayor, Enrique Be uh, Peñalosa, who set up the, uh, mil uh, the Transmillennium bus system in Bogota in the late 1990s, he wasn't thinking about carbon at all. However, these systems not only produce several billions of benefits in efficient access to the cities and for its jobs, but are uh, reducing carbon emission, uh, emissions by at least, I mean, these are sort of the latest estimates, by half a million metric tons annually in these BRT cities. And one final example, linking proactive citizenship and renewable energy, which is also referred to as decentralized energy, which is a unique opportunity for local empowerment, not only at the level of individual PV units, photovoltaic units, or so-called citizen windmills, but at the scale of the city. The, Munich, uh, the city of Munich owns its utility company. And because of that public ownership, they have set themselves a vision of becoming 100% uh, carbon neutral with its electricity by 2025. That would have been impossible if it wasn't for public ownership. So all these examples just underscore a unique opportunity our cities provide us with, to join up climate policy with other fundamental policy objectives. Philip, thank you very much indeed. And I'm, I'm very, very glad that in that um, last contribution, you, um, you got close to the democratic issues. Because I, mean, I think what we've heard is an exposition about the choices, not just about where people live in cities or in rural communities, but how people live. And uh, I mean, what we've heard this evening is nothing short of a looming catastrophe and very clear trade-offs. You know, we need renewal of infrastructure, but while we renew infrastructure, we deteriorate further progress on uh, climate change. And I think that this reflection on uh, the engagement of citizens, uh, people feeling that this is something they must own, the correlation between that being uh, the behavior of people who are better educated in better paid jobs, while uh, poor communities um, exercise very little choice. I mean, I know very well um, the community you refer to um, in, Bum in Mumbai, which is an optimistic but um, subsistence community. And I wonder if you'd like to react, you know, perhaps Bruce, to this question about engagement, <coughs> personal responsibility, Le you know, intergovernmental legislation, national legislation, where does the bite and the leverage come? <laughs> it's hard to mention national in the United States. Um, you know, here's the issue. Um, cities are not governments. The national government is a government. Uh, states are governments. They can be hijacked by partisanship, and in most parts of the world they are you know, the typical kind of ideological divisions. Cities are networks. 
uh, where you have not just representative democracy, but participatory democracy. And that's why a lot of the actions that we've all described, which again are not sufficient to have the kind of scale effect you want, are happening in cities. In the United States, what's essential for these kind of investments or regulatory reforms to happen is for people to make the argument, for leaders to make the argument, whether it's public, private, civic, or otherwise, that there's a jobs effect mm -hmm. and that there's a capital effect. Yeah. This is not just an environmental imperative, but this is, these are the kind of actions that are going to create good and quality jobs that can be coupled with the kind of skills, training, and education to bring more people into the prosperous economy. So it is particularly important in the United States to make the environmental, economic, and social relationships, mm. both in general at the policy scale, but at the granular level of geography. Yeah. And so I, I, I think that is happening. And you know, frankly, when you go into any city, um, the kind of conversations that, that naturally occur in a very integrated way, that, that doesn't really happen at the national level or at the state level, because then there are governments. They have specialized agencies. They have specialized expertise. At the city level, it becomes mashed up across <laughs> sectors, across disciplines. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think as we go forward here, cities obviously will invent many solutions. They'll innovate on products. But they're also going to send a signal higher up the food chain, so to speak. I actually think cities are at the top of the food chain. Um, that there needs to be an integrated and holistic perspective, which you know, Nick and Karen really have laid out. Yeah. But is, it's hard for, I mean, I was in the national government at the federal level for 10 years. Trust me, it is so specialized, it is so compartmentalized. The yeah. natural relationship between housing and transportation and environment does not occur. At the city level, how could it not occur? You live it every single day. Mm. So I, I, I do think that this network-driven perspective and the sort of integration of economic, social, and environmental solutions is yeah. fundamental to going forward. Thank you. Nick? I think we should also think of aspects of um, different kinds and often lower level politics. Um, if you look at uh, how um, the auto rickshaws in Delhi changed to compressed national natural gas, uh, it was essentially a legal case brought by a number of people settled in the Supreme Court on the human right to breathe. Mm. And they demanded that the auto rickshaws and uh, some of the buses and trucks uh, change to compressed natural gas. And it happened very quickly. Everybody mm. said it's never, you know, never going to work. The rickshaw drivers are going to stop. <coughs> Excuse oh, bless me. bless you. Sorry. <coughs> Are going to stop? Uh, stop uh, is the air pollution, you know? <laughs> are going to stop uh, everything? But it happened very quickly. Mm. Uh, in um, in I've done a lot of work in India over the last more than four decades, and there's one company called uh, Selco which operates in Karnataka, um, centered in Bangalore, one of the cities that uh, Karen was focusing on. And they bring microfinance and small-scale solar um, to people. Much of it is in some of it's in rural areas, but much of it's in uh, in, in cities. Mm. And those things change yeah, change exactly. uh, understandings. So I think that type of uh, mm -hmm. event, you know, whether it's through the courts or it's through uh, entrepreneurship, sure. can be extremely important in changing the way in which people understand, mm -hmm. and that's the politics. Exactly, Karen. Well, as cities are not going to act on climate change in, in and of itself, right? I mean, I think one of the things that really resonated that Philip said was that it's all about what's happening at the local level. And in the climate change world, we think about co-benefits as these other things you get when you also mitigate climate change, right? You get yeah. better health, you get uh, economic development, but that's the co-benefit because your real aim is lowering emissions. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. But that's not going to make cities act or people act. Mm -hmm. 
people act because they want to live in better cities. Exactly. They don't want to be commuting two hours or three hours. They want yeah. to breathe the air. They want to be able to live in safe, pleasant, aesthetically pleasing places. And I think we need a change in language. Mm -hmm. Because the co-benefit, if we have sustainable urbanization, is actually mitigating climate change. I would argue that Jane Jacobs is maybe one of the first environmentalists yes, mm -hmm. yes. in terms of really yeah. linking yeah. cities and the environment. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you think about the small grid, the walkability, mm -hmm. that's really all the features of low carbon human or urban settlements. George, yeah, maybe a follow up. So th I think they're absolutely right. And I, I think probably we need to move from co-benefits to mutual benefits. So we lose the directionality. But um, the question still remains, how can we inspire uh, urban populations with what is possible and what would be so much better? And I think, uh, you know, what I pick a lot, uh, what I pick up a lot is this idea of we need to be more bold and do sort of trials and test certain things, expose people to new experiences. So Exposing they actually... Exposing is critical. They actually can, yeah, live this uh, new situation. Um, has anyone, since we're doing lots of surveys, has anyone been to the Car Free Day in Paris a few weeks ago, which was a much happier event in Paris? Um, no. No, well, there were a few. But, yes, you know, th the those that commented on, on the experience of being in central Paris without any vehicles, out there with kids, with bikes, feeling safe, has been an amazing eye-opener for every single person who has been there. And very successful urban policies that were actually introduced uh, over time go back to those initial moments of getting the buy-in by people emotionally connecting to a new idea how urban life sure. can take place. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah. Now, we're going to open this up to you. We've probably got time for four brief contributions. And we've got roving microphones. Um, and what we're going to do is take four contributions. I mean, literally, 30 seconds each. Have you ever tried to express a view on climate change in 30 seconds? But tonight's your chance. Um, and then um, I'm just going to ask each of our panelists just to respond to part of the aggregate um, group of uh, questions. So who would like to start? <coughs> yes. Hi, with the responsibility for carbon emissions already generated, falling more heavily on the Northern Hemisphere, what sort of direct transfer either financially or technologically should there be between cities in the northern hemisphere and cities in the poorer global south? What was the question? The north south reductions. Yeah. yeah. Did, did, um, did you get that? Yeah. 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 Okay. Fine. Thank you very <coughs> much. Um, gentlemen here in the red jumper. Sorry, I interrupted you. What was yeah. the question? Yeah, hi. Uh, good night. Uh, um, one question maybe for the professor Nicholas Stern. It, regarding the climate change is the biggest externality well, that some authors have said that. Uh, there are some ways to mitigate it, like taxes, but maybe there are other kinds, other ways to do it, maybe with people engagement or some economic behavioral movements that are that are born like nudging. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, Crispin. It's coming. Oh, here. Great, thank you. We've heard some very good talks co covering, I think, most of the field, but not all of it. One of the things people have not spoken about is the pressure of human proliferation. The increase in the human population bears directly upon all of this. And in my own feelings about this, I feel that the first element of trying to persuade not just people or governments, but local communities, is in fact to show that change is in their interest. That yeah. you have to be able yeah. to present things in such a fashion that it's in the interest of people to make the changes that we all think desirable. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. And this is our last uh, contribution, thank you. Could you comment on the relationship between economic inequality and the quality of the environment and the yeah. possibility that it opens for mitigation? 
Okay, thank you very much indeed. Right, Bruce, well, your starter. I'll, I'll try to respond to this because I, I, I do think, again, American perspective, we're responsible for the crack up of the Great Recession. Post recession, what you have seen is a, an attempt to return to the fundamentals of what drives a modern, sophisticated economy that can create more opportunities for a broader set of its citizenry. Well, what really drives this is advanced kinds of industries that are innovative, sustainable, and ultimately create more and better jobs. And then again, training and education that can complement that. Yeah. The question, therefore, is can we begin to invest in the clean energy economy at scale through R&D, uh, and then through new financial instruments, intermediaries, institutions around sustainable infrastructure uh, and the companies that generally are going to make the sustainable products and create the sustainable services. There, there is a positive, there is an, essentially an interplay here between innovation, sustainability yeah. and inclusion yeah. Yeah. that needs to be fundamentally understood. Yeah. And, and so, at, at this point, I think this is really about norms of finance and because, again, it's not the old system of a national government basically doing what I said the first time, or in the first statement, set a price on carbon, tilt the playing field in this direction. That ain't going to happen in the United States. It's going to have to happen in, you know, through the local and state financing of these disparate kinds of activities that in the end will create the more and better jobs that will send a clear signal that this is you know, something that, that can relate to people's lives and should be fully politically supported. Okay, thanks. Um, Philip. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to reinterpret the question about, uh, actually it was for Nick, about w what other policies are out there. And I, I did hear you mentioned nudging, that's the one I leave for Nick. But I do think, besides policies, particularly from a national level, that are targeted at the individual, national governments need to take much more serious their frameworks with regards to how cities operate and how <coughs> they respond. Yes, spatial planning is the number one sort of power of urban governments. But they are very much playing a game where the rules of the game are set in most countries at the national level through infrastructure finance and funding, and even related to questions around, uh, you know, uh, developing new land for your local tax revenue, as we have heard it. And by the way, this is not just a story in China. It's actually a big issue in my home country, in Germany, where we still, with a stagnating population, are developing every day 73 hectares, with a goal of 20 hectares, how 73 hectares per day, so I don't know how many football, well, that's 73 football <laughs> fields here. But just to give you an idea, per year, that equals more or less the land, the developed land of a city of Mumbai of 12 million yeah. people. Okay? And this happens in a country which is aware of the environmental issues, sophisticated democracy, a lot of environmental pressure, good urban planning, but the national frameworks are still not up to speed, incentivizing cities to operate in the right way. Karen? The question about uh, cities in the north versus cities in the south and their relative responsibilities, I mean, absolutely, there are very different responsibilities and very different strategies going forward. Remember I said there are four main drivers of urban emissions, income or socioeconomic factors, technology, the economy, and then there's urban form. And for most cities in the, not North America, but really in the northern hemisphere, their urban form has already been built. And even though they're adding, they're really adding on the fringe. And so when we infill or when we change the urban form in these cities, it's really on the margin. For cities that are already developed, we have to look at those three other things. That's technology, changing our, maybe changing our economy, and then changing our lifestyles. Yeah, exactly. For the, for the developing country cities, it's a very different set of challenges and also opportunities. And I think this is where the scale of the population comes in. Because if you, you know, remember that slide that I showed with the upper middle income uh, greenhouse gas emissions, almost at the same level as the higher in income uh, countries. So we're gonna see that the aggregate effect of these emerging economies is gonna be significant simply because of the sheer size. Yeah. 
And then there's the lock-in effect. Thank you, Karen. Nick? Um, can I take um, one or two things together? I mean, how far do people behave only in their own self-interest? How do you get people um, together to share the benefits of what are good actions for a group as a, a whole? And um, some parts of this story, I think it's remarkable how people do get together. I mean, the fact that you've got a meeting in Paris in a couple of weeks' time, where people without uh, a global government are getting together to try to do what collectively makes more sense, is an example of groups getting together, uh, going beyond some very, very narrow sense of self-interest and looking for a broader uh, scope for community interest. So I actually think we do an injustice to people if we think they behave like the uh, consumer in Economics 101 with uh, a single narrow objective, perfect information about uh, all the options and prices, and instant calculation of self-interest. Okay. People do get together in, yeah. in ways. And secondly, it, that's a sort of at a, at a, at a big scale. Um, Incentives do matter, but people mm. see bigger pictures. Another one is an example of getting people to share from the benefits of good infrastructure. And I know what, yeah, I, buy exactly. my, I buy my electricity from uh, good energy, you should too. <laughs> I, and I have no shareholding in the, in, <laughs> in the thing. But they've been very good. At, a lot of it's wind, a lot of it's onshore wind. Yeah. Now some people don't like uh, onshore sure. wind. And what they do is they get local communities together to discuss how they can share in the benefits, some cheap electricity, playing fields for the schools. So you can actually structure things in a way that people will see the advantages of acting together. It's a little bit like, although it's too mechanical, um, one of our LSE Nobel Prize winners, Ronald Coase, um, thinking about negotiations so that yeah. people get together to share the yeah. benefit. What you need, I think, is not simply the property rights and the negotiation, that's overly rigid in Ronald Coase, but you can get people to see common and shared interests and look beyond their own very narrow story. And good examples and good behaviour can be catching. Good. Thank you, Nick. Right, OK, quick fire. Optimist or pessimist? Well, uh, if you're, if you're... Only <laughs> optimist or pessimist? If you're an urbanist, you're an optimist yeah, by, by definition. I'll give... I'll give the example of my great, the reply of my great friend Yann Artus Bertrand, who made these wonderful books, The Earth from Above, mm -hmm. which you've probably seen. And uh, he said it's too late to be a pessimist. <laughs> <laughs> great. Um, Karen, you've optimist. already told us. Absol yep. Absolute Absolute optimist. Good. Fabulous. Well, there you are. Listen, thank you all very much indeed. Happy birthday, LSE Cities. And thank you all for coming.